this time period, it exacts a heavy toll. There's so much in so much important information that you need to be considering. And I'm living this existence just watching around me things happening that are heartbreaking. And it's important to be in the Word when you're seeing these things because God puts words to the explanation about why life is the way it is. I was reading through Isaiah today as I continue my reading chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and I noticed that it's a microcosm, what were we today, a microcosm of, the, of what's going on today. I want you to pay attention to something. What does God say about those who don't believe in him? What does God say about those who do? How does God handle those who pretend to believe in him, to love him, to do all the religious things through hypocrisy, but yet their heart is not there? What are we supposed to be doing in the midst of judgment, trial, tribulation? See, I liken the story today in Isaiah to the to the parable of the seeds, Jesus says, well, there's four different kinds of people, just like seeds, right? A sower throws seeds out on the ground. The first falls on the road and they're eaten by the birds. The word, the seeds, which is the word of God, never gets to the heart of a person. They never believe. Satan eats up those seeds too quickly. And they never want to believe that the God of heaven has an answer for their salvation. Another one is thrown in, it goes into a shallow, rocky soil, and they sprout up really quick. They hear the word, they feel like it, they feel moved and empowered by the word of God. But when persecution and difficulty happens, just like the sun would beat down on a plant that doesn't have deep roots, they wither and die, they fall away. The third goes in, springs up, they hear the word with joy, and then... Well, the cares and concerns of this world and the, and the deception of money, of personal accolades, of power and st the struggle to get up the corporate ladder to have more and have more and have more. That lifestyle chokes out, just like weeds and thistles do, chokes out the good word and it becomes fruitless. It doesn't bear any fruit. And the fourth is the one that goes into the ground, digs its roots deep, and comes up fruitful in the word of God. Those who seek after God and live a life that is fruitful in his kingdom. Now I want you to pay attention because out of four people, three out of four fail. And I want you to see it's just like in this story, those who, are, who, who believe in God and are fruitful seek after the Lord, are obedient to what he has to say, makes the correct moves and, 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 and crucifies themselves, dies to their themselves and gives their life over to God. And it is tremendously beautiful. But you have those people who don't believe in God at all and those people are swept away. They don't even want to. And they tend to bring their, <clears throat> their beliefs of unbelief through persecution against up against those who do believe but you do have those people who kind of believe pretend to believe go to church do the religious stuff hypocritically and say that they're a christian when they're not really and these people are in dangerous waters because at any given time life can end and life can end quickly why I say this is because the young lady across the street who's been suffering from cancer for a long time, she's been in hospice. She was given two weeks to two months to live, and she died today. Now that family over there was waiting for her death. They knew that it was coming. They just didn't know when. And so all death is sudden because the day you thought you had, now you don't. The week you had planned, the Thanksgiving holiday you have in two days, now suddenly you don't. This is important because when you're not paying attention to what's going on and you know that there is a day coming at some point, 
in your life, you don't live to die. You don't live to look forward to or worry about that die, that death, that, that time, that day. But only God knows that time. And the question is, is what are you doing with your time? Because death comes on us, and once death comes on us, it's too late to make a decision for or against Christ. Jesus simply said, you're for me or you're against me. And in a time when all of these false teachers, all of these false doctrines, doctrines of demons, stuff drawing people away from the truth that is in the Bible, my heart is always to bring you the word of God because there's tremendous power in it. That it never returns void. That it always goes out and accomplishes something for which God meant it to accomplish. If I read this word to you today, either it will go into your heart and will draw you a little bit closer to God. Or it will go down and it will push you further away. But there is no way you can hear what's being said and stand there motionless and emotionless. That it doesn't mean anything. Guard your heart. And so as I'm reading through Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet telling, telling Israel via the word of God, it's important for me to read through, the, through the, um, the books of the prophets because they have direct words of God. And I, can, I know that everything written in the Bible is led along by the Holy Spirit and spiritually discerned. And it was written there because, because there's no way that 1,600 years and, and, and 44 authors write 66 books in three, ten, three languages on three continents. And there is a perfect continuity. There's no way it could have happened unless God was in the details. But I want to hear from God. Because God's word tells me what's going to happen because God knows the end from the beginning. There's no God like him. There's no other God who can do this. No other book that is prophetic. No other way. No other way to heaven except through Lord Jesus Christ. So Isaiah chapter 29 verse 1 says, What sorrow awaits Ariel, the city of David? Year after year, you celebrate your feasts, yet I will bring disaster upon you, and there will be much weeping and sorrow, for Jerusalem will become what her name Ariel means, an altar covered with blood. I will be your enemy, surrounding Jerusalem and attacking its walls. I will build siege towers and destroy it. And then deep from the earth you will speak. From low in the dust your words will come. Your voice will whisper from the ground like ghosts conjured up from the grave. God says, you guys continue to do all your religious work? See, the, the law told us how to, how to be religious. The law told us how to worship God. But if you're worshiping God as a part of a, of a get-together to have a feast, to enjoy each other's company, to drink until you're drunk or whatever, and, it, and your heart is not in it, then, then it's hypocritical to, up to God. God says, you know what, I don't really care about what you're doing. I only care about where your heart is. Samuel had something to say to, to Saul about that. He's like, I, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your mercy. I want your true obedience to me. Put your heart on me. Don't worry about the works. The works are supposed to be a, a substantial picture of your heart, not the other way around. We get ourselves caught in this place where, hey, if I go to church and I tithe and I read the Bible for, for five seconds a week in, the, in that hour that I'm sitting in church, then I'm a Christian and I can say it. But that action only, you don't do the actions in an effort to prove you're a Christian. You've got to be a Christian and those actions prove it. And if that's the case, it's got to be daily, hourly, minutely devotion to God. So he says, this is the city of David, Jerusalem, also known as Ariel. In this myth, he's like, yeah, I, I've seen you guys do this stuff, but yet... I'll bring disaster to you anyway. And I'm going to bring weeping and sorrow because you guys continually live a life against what I've asked you to do. 
And this is a problem. Verse 5, suddenly your ruthless enemies will be crushed like the finest of dust. Your many attackers will be driven away like chaff before the wind. Suddenly, in an instant, I, the Lord of heaven's armies, will act for you with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with whirlwind and storm and consuming fire. All the nations fighting against Jerusalem will vanish like a dream. Those who are attacking her walls will vanish like a vision in the night. A hungry person dreams of eating, but wakes up still hungry. A thirsty person dreams of drinking, but it's still faint from the thirst when morning comes. So it will be with your enemies, with those who attack Mount Zion. He says, I'm going to bring disaster to you, but there will be a day when I'm going to vanquish your enemies. Your enemies are going to think in their heart and mind that they can do something. They dream about it, but they get up and it's still lacking. We learned about this in our study about Assyria. When Assyria is sitting outside of Jerusalem sending letters to King Hezekiah saying, don't you think that you're going to stop me? Nobody can stop me. No other God has stopped me. That's a dream because he hadn't come up against the God of Israel yet. And the God of Israel, of course, had a prophecy through it, through Isaiah. And the prophecy, of course, was fulfilled because every prophecy uh, given by God is fulfilled. Verse 9, are you amazed? <laughs> are you incredulous? Don't you believe it? Well, then go ahead and be blind. You are stupid, but not from wine. You stagger, but not from liquor. For the Lord has poured out on you a spirit of deep sleep. He's closed the eyes of your prophets and visionaries. All of the future events in this vision are like a sealed book to them. When you give to those who can read, they will say, well, we can't read it because it's sealed. And when you give it to those who cannot read, they will say, we don't know how to read. <laughs> it says, are you amazed by what I'm doing? Are you amazed that I'm going to bring... I'm going to bring bloodshed on your city. And then are you amazed that I'm going to turn around and I'm going to vanquish your enemies because I'm in control and I'm doing what I've told you I was always going to do? Is this amazing to you? Because you don't believe in me. You're not acting like it makes it anything. You're acting like you're drunk. You're acting like you stagger from here or there with lack of wisdom and not understanding. Why is it that you don't believe me? I've proven myself before. I think this is an interesting way of saying this. Are you amazed and incredulous? Don't you believe it? Well, if you don't believe it, then go ahead and be blind. You're stupid, but not for wine. You stagger, but not from liquor. For the Lord has poured out on you a spirit of deep sleep. You have this blindness. Your prophets and visionaries aren't seeing it for what it really is. So what's happening is, is the future events that I've told you are happening aren't being seen correctly by your prophets and visionaries because they're not seeking me they're only doing all the things that they well they feel are religious but they, their heart is far from me they're pretending and i'm not going to open the doors to the words of god to the prophetic future if you're not going to be a part of it i'm not going to be involved in it so he says here if you have the ability to read it well it's sealed up i don't have the understanding and if you can't read it, then you're just, look, I'm just totally outside of it. I don't have any idea. I need someone to tell me what it says, but the people who are supposed to read it, well, they haven't been praying. They're not prayed up, and they're prophets and visionaries that are acting drunk and stupid because they've been put into this deep sleep. A veil's been pulled over their eyes about seeing that because they're not seeking God. Time is short. And if you have the ability to look into the word and see what's coming, you will see and understand. But you have to seek it with a mind that is seeking God. Because he will, he will very well, very generously open up your heart to see what's coming. My heart here is to provide you, through a heart that is open to the Lord, what's coming so that you can see how close we are. Why is it important? Because that young lady died today. And you will too. At some point you don't know. And at that point it will be too late. We don't know how to read. Verse 13. And so the Lord says, These people say they're mine. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rote. Because of this, I will once again astound these hypocrites in amazing wonders. The wisdom of the wise will pass away, and the intelligence of the intelligent will disappear. This is the hypocritical idea. These prophets and visionaries have this if blind pulled over their eyes. They can't read the sealed book because their heart, their lips say they're Christians, but their heart is far from God. He says they worship me, but it's only these man-made rules. It's all only it's only this stuff that they've learned through the law. It's only these feasts and and all of this silliness. I don't care about that. The feasts and the and the sacrifices and the rules and the laws and all of this stuff is only supposed to show you that you need me and to give your heart to me, not to go out there and feel good about yourself so that you cannot worry about me. That's not how God wanted this to be. This is important. The Lord says these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Where is your heart with the Lord today? Are you pretending? Are you using a temp, the, the word Christian as a byword, as a, as a way of showing other people that you have some sort of self-righteousness to yourself? I used to arrest people who would steal and then they would swear to me they didn't steal because they're Christian. I'm Christian. I don't steal even though I have a video showing exactly what they're doing. Their, their, their lips say they're with you, but their heart is far from it. You need to look at this. This is a self-examination opportunity. Is your heart with God or is your heart with the things you think worship God? Two different things. Verse 15, what sorrow awaits those who try to hide their plans from the Lord, who do, who do their evil deeds in the dark? The Lord can't see us, they say. He doesn't know what's going on. How foolish can you be? He is the potter, and he is certainly greater than you, the clay. Should the created thing say of the one who made it? He didn't make me. <laughs> Does a jar ever say the potter who made me is stupid. I don't have to put any commentary here. God knows what you're doing in the dark. Everything. There will come a day when everything is open and naked before the one who has to give account. It says so in Hebrews. We know that he sees what we're doing in the dark. We can't hide it. But we read through the epistles of John that say, hey... Those who didn't want to come into the light liked the dark because the dark covered up their wickedness. This is the problem. He's like, these people doing wickedness are like, well, you know what? I can hide it because God doesn't know what I'm doing in the dark. And that's a big mistake because God will make you look foolish in the midst of what you're doing. There will be a day when all of your sins in the dark will come to light and they will be revealed. See to it, your sins will find you out. Repent and turn away from them immediately and give your life over to God because you don't know how long your time is. Oh, what sorrow awaits those who try to hide their plans from the Lord? Who do their evil in the dark? The Lord can't see us. They say he doesn't know what's going on. How foolish can you be? <laughs> He's the potter, and he is certainly greater than you, the clay. He created you. He's in complete control of you. And the end will be in control of him too. Does a jar ever say the potter who made me is stupid? Search your heart on that one. Examine it. Questioning God in such a manner? That's blasphemy. Verse 17, soon, and it won't be very long, the forests of Lebanon will become a fertile field, and the fertile field will yield bountiful crops. In that day, the deaf will hear words read from a book. And the blind will see through the gloom and the darkness. The humble will be filled with fresh joy from the Lord. The poor will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. 
The scoffer will be gone, the arrogant will disappear, and those who plot evil will be killed. Those who convict the innocent by their false testimony will disappear. A similar fate awaits those who use trickery to pervert justice and who tells lies to destroy the innocent. That is why the Lord who redeemed Abraham says to the people of Israel, My people will no longer be ashamed or turn pale with fear. For when they see their many children and all the blessings I've given them, they will recognize the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob, and they will stand in awe of God of Israel. Then the, then the wayward will gain understanding, and complainers will accept instruction. There is coming a day. And back then in the Old Testament, it says it's not going to be very long. Of course, of course we know that a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years to 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 the God. We don't know how long that is. We're still awaiting this day, he's speaking of here, where the blind will see and the and the and the and the deaf will hear. And and the humble will see God for who he is and will truly be saved. And then the wickedness and evilness of people, those who are sinners, those who are evil, those who have who have oppressed people and who have uh, people who have become victims because of them, they will be vanquished. That day is coming. And the rapture starts that direction. The rapture of the church of those who've been saved will be taken into heaven. Those who are wicked will lay here on earth and will have to deal with what's coming for seven year period of time of judgment upon the earth. And then judgment day comes. And that will be the end of those who are wicked and the saving of those who have accepted Christ to be their savior. God says they will, people will notice. They will notice the wonderful things God is doing for them. They will, the blinders will be lifted. They will see God for who he really is. They will be blessed and they will love him forever. They will be his people. So moving into chapter 30, he continues. Remember, the Bible doesn't have chapters or verse breaks. It was a continuous document. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, was a continuous document. So he continues the thought process here. He says, what sorrow awaits my rebellious children? He's going back to the people who don't believe in God. Says the Lord, you make plans that are contrary to mine. You make alliances not directed by my spirit thus piling up your sins. For without consulting me, you've gone down to Egypt for help. You've put your trust in Pharaoh's protection. You have tried to hide in his shade. But by trusting Pharaoh, you will be humiliated. And by depending on him, you will be disgraced. For though his power extends to Zoan, and his officials have arrived in Hanus, all those who trust in him will be ashamed. He will not help you. Instead, he will disgrace you. Now, we need to stop for a minute to make a discussion. Because Egypt, although a country that was against Jerusalem at this point, is a picture of the world. We can go all the way back to the Exodus. And Israel is being held captive under oppression of Pharaoh. And, those, and Moses delivers them through God's power, delivers them out of oppression, out of the world system, out of the sinfulness of this world, and into a promised land guided by God. And in that wilderness time is a time of testing, from being, being delivered from the sinfulness of the world through a time of testing and sanctification and understanding, and into the into this promised land when Moses gave the reins over to Joshua. So we need to see Egypt in this point for what it is, the world system. And if you are worried about the world system saving you, about a politician, about a, about a rule, about a law, about anything, getting back to normal, lifting mandates, putting mandates, doing medical procedures, doing all this stuff, being tolerant of sinfulness, whatever it is that you are working on leaning against, you will be disgraced and ashamed because God is going to judge the world system and it's not going to be pretty. Just read Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Well, we'll pass, we'll skip forward a little bit to verse 80, uh, 8. 30 verse 8 says, now go and write these words 
write them in a book. They will stand until the end of time as a witness that these people are stubborn rebels who refuse to pay attention to the Lord's instructions. They tell the seers, stop seeing visions. They tell the prophets, don't tell us what is right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. Forget all this gloom. Get off your narrow path. Stop telling us about your Holy One of Israel. Ooh, doesn't that sound like today? Now we're talking about Israel. We're talking about Judah. But realize that the Word of God is always going to be around. It's one of two things that are eternal. The Word of God and the souls of men. So he says, write these words down for the end of time, for the end of eternity. What we're learning about the rebellion of this people will help us to avoid the pitfall. That's the point. Look at these people. They tell the seers, those are prophets, stop seeing visions. They tell the prophets, don't tell us what's right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. Forget all this gloom and get off your narrow path. Oh, tolerance. Don't tell me. Don't get into your bigoted rules. I don't care about what your Bible says. Don't tell me what the Bible, what God wants, how he feels or whatever. Be tolerant. Tell me lies. Be tolerant of my sins. Be accepting of everything that's going on around you. Let everyone's truth be his own truth. This is what we're dealing with today. And so many pulpits are quiet about what's being, what should be said versus what these people or what the people around them are telling them to say. That's what's going on here. The religious people who know what's going on are being told to shut up and don't be bigots and change your beliefs and don't be tolerant and open up that really narrow view that Jesus is the only way. Yep, you better step off of that because we have equity, we have we have CRT and equity and LGBTQ and anti-vaxxers and blah, 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 blah. All of these things people want you to tolerantly accept even though this Bible is very clear about what's legal in God's eyes and what's not. You best get to, to cracking on believing what's important because the end of Romans chapter 1 is a, is a decisive problem. It tells you what people will be like at the end of the day and the sins that are of tolerance that we see. And by the time we get to that point, which we're standing in it now, it says that those who who commit those problems are deserving of death. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Those who do those habitual sinners are doing that. And then those people who decide that it's okay to bear them up or to support them or to be tolerant of them are just as guilty. We're riding a razor thin line. Judgment is around the corner. God will decide to be tired of this at his appointed time. I don't know what day that is, but it could be at any point from here on out for the next however long. And the signs in the Bible tell us it's near. And why is that important? Because you don't know when your day is. You don't know when your day is. Verse 8 through 11 is a telling picture of what's going on in the church today. And that's dangerous. I will give you everything the Bible says. I will bring it to you in technicolor. I, I will not water it down. Paul said, you will not be able, <clears throat> you will be, not be able to blame me for not presenting the entire counsel of God. I've brought it all to you. You've heard it all. You cannot hold me accountable for leaving, watering it down or leaving stuff out. I brought you everything God had to say. And that's why I go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I want you to see God's truth. Verse 12, this is the reply of the Holy One of Israel. Remember, in, in 8 through 11, this is these people going on. Isaiah is saying, this is what you are saying. I, if I hear you right, this is how you're acting. This is how God is going to respond to you. Verse 12. This is the reply of the Holy One of Israel. Because you despise what I tell you and trust instead in oppression and lies, calamity will come upon you suddenly. Suddenly. Do you know about you know what I have to say about the word suddenly? It's sudden. I know it's deeply profound. 
but it happens at a time you don't know and it happens quickly. If you're not ready, it will overtake you like a thief in the night. That's the whole point Jesus makes about the rapture. You will be ready. <clears throat> it comes suddenly like a bulging wall that bursts and falls in an instant it will collapse and come crashing down. You will be smashed like a piece of pottery, shattered so completely that there won't be a piece big enough to carry coals from a fireplace or a little water from the well. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. That's a gospel message. Return, and uh, you need to return to God. That means to repent of your sins, turn away from that, do a 180, go the other direction, and seek God with all your heart. That's the only way that you will be saved, and you will find rest in that salvation. But in quietness and confidence in your strength. It says, only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. That's faith in God. But you would not, you would have none of it. You didn't choose that. I told you you needed to choose it for your salvation, but you failed to choose it. You said, no, we will get our help from Egypt. We will get our help from the world system. A world system? Look what the world system has to offer you now. Abortion on demand up until the point of birth. We're, we're, we're mutilating our children. We're forcing medical procedures that aren't needed. People are dying without need. We have fights and divisions and difficulties and we have and, and discriminations. We have this, this wars, world war Three is around the corner. Nuclear proliferation. We've got lying. We've got cheating. We've got stealing. We've got lions and tigers and bears. Oh, God. This is what the Egypt brings to you, and you want to put your help in Egypt? God's like, gosh, you just totally lose the point. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle, but... The only swiftness you are going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. One of them will chase a thousand of you. Five of them will make all of you flee. You will be left like a lonely flagpole on a hill or tattered banner on a distant mountaintop. You who go to Egypt for help without seeking me, without believing in me, without repenting in me, without praying about it, you will be destroyed. But, verse 18... The Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is faithful, God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. By the way, God will not make you do anything. God is going to wait patiently for you to see the truth and you to see how Egypt's going to destroy you and you're going to deal with your pain and your suffering and your, and your problems, all of that stuff, and it should bring you back to God. See, right? Because Romans chapter 2 tells us the goodness of God leads to repentance, but he's not going to come and thunk you over the head and tell you you need to do something because that's not true love. God wants you to choose him. He doesn't want to make you. I can't make someone love me. You have to choose to love me. And true love only is depicted by the idea that you have the true opportunity to walk away if you don't want to. Adam and Eve had one rule, one job. They were to love God and stay away from that silly tree. But the minute they broke that rule, that's a rebellion against God. He proved to God they don't love him. And now we're trying to get back. He's proven his love through handling the sinful problem by sending his son to die. But you have to choose to love him so that he can love you. So the Lord, verse 18, the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is faithful, God, blessed for those who wait for his help. This is the word for the day. See, because there are so many people out there today. So many people out there today who are who aren't listening. They're rebelling. So many people there today who have stood in a church service and stood up and said a prayer, and all of a sudden they can call themselves Christians and maybe they hang out at work. 
Or maybe they hang out at home. Or maybe they hang out at church and they tithe and they do the things that they're supposed to do because the Bible says so, but they don't live a life that is given over to them. And, and God is up there saying, gosh, they talk to me with their mouth. They, they, they love me with their, with their words, but their heart's far from me. He's waiting for you to come back. He's waiting for you to come to him. He wants to give you everything that his power can give you. And all of that happens. It's all eternity. Eternity of living in the goodness of God. But you have to choose it. Remember what I said at the beginning. There are, there are certain kinds of people. There are those who believe in God. Like me, I've given wholeheartedly over to the Lord and I have never had a reason to regret it. His blessings upon my life have been tremendously... I, I, can't, I can't quantify them. David even says it. You have all these great thoughts about me. I can't even count them in order. I can't even count them. You love me so much. You do so much, so many great things for me. But you have those people who are choked out by the cares and concerns of life, running after jobs and running after money and possessions and all, the, all this stuff. And what it does is it draws them away. A, a, a former neighbor of mine started a church but then got drawn away by needing, wanting more money so he could buy a new truck and he never got to church again. Drawn away by the cares and concerns of this world. Then persecution is going to increase, no doubt about it, and you better be ready for a spiritual battle. But that battle can't draw you and drag you away from the word of God. It will do many of them, drawn away by, by doctrines of demons and people who will make you feel silly because of your beliefs. But you have to make a decision about whether this book is true about the creator of all of heaven, of all of, the, of, of everything that's ever existed. And if all the prophecies that we, I just read to you came true... And all the rest of the prophecies that I read to you that haven't come true are going to come true. He's, he's got a perfect track record of doing that. Then you have to decide whether this book is illustrative of God's faithfulness. Looking back over your life, you have to look back in the past to see that he verifiably faithful in the past. That gives us the prerequisite to be able to then prove he is faithful in the future. And that's really important because we're going to go into a time when things are getting really hard. But the Bible tells us what's going to happen, and it's happening, and it's proving his faithfulness yet again. So your whole heart is, you don't know the day you're going to die. God bless her. A heavy day, a heavy toll. But you don't know that day. And I, and I hate to tell you this, but you're not going to go to to heaven on your good works, on being a good person. It doesn't work that way. There's only one way. Remember what it's said in here. It's like, hey, get off your narrow path and tell us lies and tell us you, you, you want, they're seeking, churches are seeking pastors to tell them lies that make them feel good, that make their ears itch, that help them hear what they want to hear. But the Bible tells us about hell and about sin and about death and about eternal damnation and about, about demonic depression. And all of this stuff is real. Heaven is a real place and so is hell. And that leads you to a place you have a decision. Choose one or the other. Choose to be a seed that lands in the, in the grass and into the fertile soil and shoot, your, shoot your, your roots down deep into the waters of God's word and bear fruit that you can be a blessing to all these people who have no idea what's coming upon the earth those who you got those people who can't read the book because they can't un because they can't unseal it you got those who can't read at all Jesus said that there's a whole bunch of people out there who need to hear the gospel there's a whole bunch of people out there who are going through battles that you don't know about so seek the Lord while you still can. Get saved. Be swept away by the Spirit. Bring your Bible. Bring your word into your heart. Hide it so you can use it in ways to love other people in a time when it's more needed than ever, in, ever before. I hope this is encouraging. Because you don't know when this is going to end. And, and I pray that you would seek after the one who's going to come and take his bride away. 
And I, my bigger prayer is, is that you'll be ready, that it won't, that it won't surprise you as you're sitting around waiting to see what's happened. You need proof that Jesus, before you can, you want to let go of your sinful nature. You don't want to let go of it waiting for, to, to, till Jesus proves himself. Of course, when he does, it'll be too late. You'll be stuck here for the seven year tribulation. And if you survive that, God help you. I, I hope that you use this, pass it along. Tell someone about Jesus today and remember you were loved. Be blessed.